And if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 13. As Mike mentioned, this summer we are spending time studying the life of Abraham, getting to know this patriarch. So far we have seen God call Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, uh, has brought him to the promised land. Uh, Abraham obeyed the call of God. God made promises, made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And then the next thing we see is Abraham going to Egypt and a lapse in faith that we looked at last week as he went down to Egypt. But even in the midst of his lapse of faith, God still blessed him and prospered him. And he comes back to Canaan in chapter 13 as a as a wealthy man. Uh, the, the episode we're going to look at this morning in chapter 13 is the first of three, three stories that involve Abraham's nephew Lot, a trilogy of stories that involve Abraham and Lot. In this one, Abraham and Lot separate. Next week in chapter 14, we will see how Abraham rescues Lot in the midst of a war. And then in chapters 18 and 19, Abraham again rescuing his nephew Lot from destruction. Abraham actually interceding to God and God rescuing Lot from destruction in Sodom and Gomorrah. So let's read Genesis 13 together, get the details of what happened. Before we do that, pray with me that God would open our hearts and give us the gift of divine illumination. Lord, we ask that you would prepare our hearts now to accept your word. We ask that you would silence in us any voice but your own and that in hearing we might also obey your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, this is Genesis 13. It's the word of God for the people of God this morning. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold, and he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents so that, he had, uh, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we're kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. If you take the right hand, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley, and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of this land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent, and he came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Now, the, the account's pretty straightforward, what's going on. Uh, this account between Abraham and Lot, you can kind of break it up into uh, about four sections. The first section, verses 1 through 4, introduce the setting. Abram and his family moving back from Egypt, back into Canaan, where they had first settled in Canaan. 
uh, where Abram had built a, an altar to the Lord. In fact, let, go ahead and put up the map, if you would, Megan, and we'll turn the lights off. And this is a little bit of a, uh, of a hard-to-see map, but the big thing in the middle here is the, uh, the Dead Sea. Jerusalem, or, uh, you, see, you see Bethlehem right there? Okay, right above Bethlehem is Jerusalem. So Bethlehem, there's about a six mile, this gives you scale, six miles between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. So up north of Jerusalem is where you see Bethel and Ai. That's where Abram had built the altar to the Lord and where his family had first settled and where they ultimately came back to. Now what's going to happen, as we'll see as we get into this, uh, actually go ahead to the next slide. No, go go back, all right? What's going to happen is... um, Abram and Lot are up in Bethel and Ai. They're going to separate. A, uh, Lot is going to move toward Jericho. That's the Jordan River Valley right there in the middle, up above the Dead Sea. He's going to move over in that direction, and then ultimately he's going to move down along the Dead Sea. And you see down here at the bottom where it says Lot's tent. Now we can go to the next slide. We'll put it up at the top. There's Lot's tent down near the bottom of the Dead Sea. And you can see these red dots over here are the cities of Sodom, Gomorrah, Zoar. And, and others, the five cities of the plain. We, we really, the truth is we don't exactly know where Sodom and Gomorrah were because when God destroys something, he destroys it real good. And so we don't know where that wound up. But Lot ultimately moved his tent down in this direction. And you see that body of water that says the five cities of the plain, that's not there anymore because the Dead Sea is not only receding, but when God, that, that area of, of uh, land is, is infertile and salt covered and it's it's destroyed. So the Valley of Siddim down here is the area where uh, we'll get to next week. Okay, you can take the map off. Moses makes a point to mention in this story uh, that Abram had become quite wealthy. Now he, in fact, he, the, the Hebrew word here is he's heavy with wealth. He's, and, and if you've got a lot of gold and silver and animals, you are heavy with wealth. And in fact, the whole idea of moving as a wealthy man presents a little bit of a challenge. I mean, this week our son David drove to Colorado, okay? And, and so Friday morning he got up and threw some stuff in a bag and he, he got in the car and went. It was easy. He's traveling light, okay? It's, just, it's him going to Colorado. It was easy. When we took our family to Colorado a number of years ago, packing the car was not as simple a procedure as it was for David, all right? We had to get everybody packed in. We had to have assigned seating in the minivan. We had to have... Uh, uh, Walkmans, individual Walkman. These were cassette players, kids. This was pre-MP3 players. We had to have everybody had to have their Walkman and their headphones and know where they were sitting and they had their, their pillows and everything had to be set. And when you got to the hotel where you were going to stay at night and you had to unpack the whole car and then you had to pack it back up the next morning, that was a little bit of an ordeal. Okay, And we were just taking a little bit of our stuff. Abram and his family are taking everything. And they've gotten more along the way Imagine breaking camp and setting up camp as you're traveling from Egypt back to Bethel and Ai. It was, he was heavy with stuff and heavy with money, and the travel was slow, and he was weighed down. So that's the, that's the first part of this. They're resettling up in this area, and then verses 5 through 7, you get to the part of the story where the conflict occurs. In, uh, Lot also has stuff and money. Verse 2 says Abraham had, lot, uh, had livestock, gold, and silver. Verse 5 says Lot had flocks and herds and tents. So they become wealthy in Canaan, and in fact so wealthy that verse 6 says the land could not support both of them. And pause here for a minute and just ask the question, how did Lot get so rich? He's, he's Abraham's nephew. What, what was he doing? Basically, Lot got rich by being around Abraham. Abraham was getting rich, and Lot was getting rich in the process. Uh, and, and the riches that came, some of it we saw Abraham got last week when the Pharaoh gave Abraham a bunch of stuff saying, I like your sister. Oh, she's not your sister. But he got to keep the stuff, okay? <laughs> Lovely parting gifts that he got as, as they went home. But he has acquired over time p- uh, servants and livestock. I don't know if he's a shrewd trader or a good farmer or how it's all worked, but he's gotten rich. And Lot, by being around Abraham, has picked up on some of this, and he's gotten a start in life, and he's become wealthy as well. Both of these men had a lot of animals, and if you have a lot of animals, what else do you need a lot of? You need a lot of pasture land. 
You need a lot of food. If the animals are gonna, if gonna have, support a lot of animals, you have to have a lot of farm. I mean, we've got, we've got a big backyard, but if you put 30 horses in our backyard, there's no way that the backyard would support the 30 horses. If you had sheep grazing in our backyard, maybe two would be able to get enough grazing done there. You gotta have the right amount of land to support your livestock, and, and this is what's happened. Their herds have gotten so big <clears throat> that in the morning, Abraham's herdsmen get up and they say, okay, let's go down to the pasture and feed the flocks. And they take them down there and lots of guys are already there feeding. And they go, hey, 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 get your guys, our sheep need, no, we got here first. You got here first, our, these are Abraham's sheep, those are lots. And they're having these quarrels about who, okay, you get it Tuesday and Thursday, we get it. But, but if you get it Tuesday, by Wednesday, there's nothing there. So they're having these quarrels, that's what's going on. And verse seven adds to the fact that the Canaanites and the Perizzites are also in the land which is there either to tell us, number one, that the pagans are watching what happens, or to tell us you got other people who are trying to use the same land for grazing. Uh, so we're not exactly sure what, what that's there, but that detail's added in. And verses 8 through 13, the th third section in the story, is where the, uh, the, the deal is struck. The separation is, is uh, suggested and agreed upon. Abraham gives Lot the option of where he'd like to move. Lot looks up, he sees the Jordan River Valley, and he says, I'm going to go down there because it looks well watered and fertile. And Abram stays in Canaan. By the way, the Jordan River Valley to which Lot moved was outside of the land of promise. It, he moved outside of what God had promised to Abram. Eventually, getting down to Sodom and Gomorrah, he was beyond the borders of the land of promise. Abram stays in Canaan. And he takes his flocks and herds and eventually winds up in Hebron. And this section ends with a foreshadowing when it says that Lot is headed toward this exceedingly dangerous place where the men of Sodom and Gomorrah are evil people. And then finally, you get to verses 14 through 18, the last section in this chapter. <clears throat> God reaffirms and provides more detail for Abram about the covenant that he's making with him. He reaffirms that the land that Abraham sees will one day belong to his descendants and uh, that his descendants will be as many as the dust of the earth. And I just want to point out that this whole chapter, this whole uh, pericope is, is filled, it, it's bookended with worship on the front end and worship on the back end. Abram goes back to the place where he'd built the altar and he worships the Lord in verse 4 of chapter 13. And at the end, he settles now in Hebron or in Hebron and he sets up a new camp. And the first thing he does is he builds an altar to the Lord. This is very different from what we saw in the last chapter when Abraham went to Egypt. This is Abraham uh, walking with the Lord. Now, last week when we looked at the story of Egypt, I had six points that I it kind of came to me, and this week I only have five points. So you, this is a uh, this is a bonus for you here. For only five observations, but we're going to put them up on the screen again, and we'll just walk our way through these five observations. Here's the first one: prosperity and riches can weigh you down and lead to strife and discord in your family. Now, if we wanted to, we could just pause here and say, would anybody like to offer testimony on this? And we would we could probably go till noon with people sharing testimony of how money and stuff in families have created strife and discord. I could tell you stories in, in my own family if uh, the witnesses weren't still alive to, to talk about it, you know? I mean, the issues are there. And, and I know some of you are thinking, well, you know, I'd like to test that theory because I'd like to have a little enough money that it would create some strife. There was an, it's an old Dean Martin song in the 1950s. Some of you are going, who is Dean Martin? I get it. Mike and I know who Dean Martin is, I and mean, we're probably the only two that would even come close to recognize. Oh, but knowing the song, the song was Money is a Problem. Money, and the line was, money is a problem. If money is a problem, I wish I had a few problems to spend. That's what they said. In fact, they went on to say, too much gold can burn, uh, can burn you just like too much sun. I don't want to be a millionaire, I just want to live like one. Well, this issue had become an issue, this, this money and stuff issue for Abram and, and uh, Lot, and it was creating discord in their families. I want you to turn to, any t anytime you hear about the challenges of wealth, it ought to trigger in your mind 1 Timothy chapter 6. First, and I want you to go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, because this is probably the definitive passage in the Bible that talks about the dangers of wealth 
and how we are to handle wealth as Christians. By the way, everybody here is wealthy. Okay? I don't know your, your balance sheet. I don't know your financial situation. I don't know how much you owe the credit card company. But you live in a prosperous land and among the nations, uh, among the people of the nations, you are among the wealthiest 10% in the world today. I, I think I can say that pretty certainly about everybody who's in the room. So this passage is talking to us as wealthy people. Look at verse 9 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says, Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many fangs. Now, stop right there. Here, here's what you've got to get. The problem is not the money. Money is not a bad thing. You look back at that passage, look at the verbs in that passage. Desire to be rich. Those who crave, those who love. The, the problem is an inordinate craving or love or desire for riches. It's not money that leads you into temptation. It's the desire for money that leads you into temptation. It's the love of money. It's the craving that causes people to wander from the faith and pierce themselves with many fangs. There is a... Here's, money is one of the leading um, idols in our culture today. Money is one of the things that, that people look to as a replacement for God in our culture today. Money gives you security. Money gives you happiness. Money gives you peace. I mean, we can make the list. And what we're saying is all of the things that God has promised to do for you, to be for you, we're, we're turning to money and say, that's where I really get it done better. That's, I like it. I, I want to have money. I am secure because I have a 501. No, I have a 401. Whatever. I, I don't have one of those things. I have a K. I have one of those K things. I have a retirement account. That's why I'm secure. No, you're secure because of God. I, I have peace because I know that if, if something happens, I can cover it. No, you're secure because God will care for you. See, this is how we turn our attention to a substitute God and start to worship it and start to love it. Turn, look down at verses 17 through 19 because Paul gives instruction to how the rich are to live in verse 17. For the rich in this present age, you and me, charge them not to be haughty, proud, arrogant, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. The rich are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. When I was, in, when I was starting in radio, uh, I was in sales. And one of my first jobs as a sales rep, so I went to a a sales motivation class. Um, it, was, it was a sales seminar that was designed to provide motivation and encouragement for us to be better salespeople. And I remember the class pretty well because it, it wasn't long into the class before I, I was sniffing it out and going, something's wrong here. The, the class leader, the, the slides and the video, whatever it was we were watching, was talking about what are your dreams for yourself? What is it that you, that you want in life? Is it, a, is it a nicer house for you and your family? Is it a newer car? Would you like to be able to travel, to take vacations? How about a boat? I remember the boat being in there particularly. You know, it's like they were, they were just going for whatever it was that people crave. It, and, and then based on that, you were supposed to take what is it that you want, get a picture of that in your mind, and then build steps for how you're going to achieve that thing. And this was your motivation to be a better salesman, was to indulge yourself in the things you wanted. Well, at the end of the, sem the, the lecture, the video, we'd watched it, and the facilitator got up and said, now I want you all to write down on your piece of paper what it is that, that's your goal, what it is that you want more than anything. 
to motivate you in sales. So I thought and I thought and I finally wrote something down. And this was a Christian radio station, so they came to me and they said, what, what is it that you wrote down? And I said, I wrote down Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. They did not like that answer. Okay. <laughs> It kind of disrupted the whole mood of the sales seminar because it wasn't supposed to work that way. I was supposed to be fueled by a new car or a new house or vacations. And I was looking at that and going, you know what? That's in the Lord's hands. I, I, I want to pursue the things of the kingdom. I'll let the Lord worry about how many vacations I get or where I get to travel to. And by the way, let me just say this. We've been able to travel to some amazing places. We have been blessed beyond measure financially. Now, I'm not, I'm not here saying, look, just give it to the Lord. He will bless you financially. Some people go through very hard times. I'm just saying, Marianne and I have looked at one another and said, God has been very gracious to us. But it's never been a, a, that, that's never been the goal. That's never been the lust or the craving for us. And I, I think had it been, we would have been ruined on all kinds of snares because I've seen it happen to people. Back in January, there was an article in the, Wall, or, uh, in the New York Times. A, uh, a former hedge fund trader on Wall Street, a 30-year-old named Sam Polk, wrote an article called For the Love of Money. And here's how he started his article. He said, in my last year on Wall Street, my bonus was $3.6 million. And I was angry because it wasn't big enough. I was 30 years old, had no children to raise, no debts to pay, no philanthropic goal in mind. I wanted more money for exactly the same reason an alcoholic wanted a drink. I was addicted. His problem, as he learned, was he had a love for money. It wasn't money that was the issue. It was his lust for money. Your, your abundance or your lack of money is not the issue in your life. The issue is, do you, is money your God? Are you serving it? Is it... Uh, is it what you are craving? The issue isn't outside of you with your bank account. The issue is inside of you and for how you're dealing with this. And, and money and stuff can weigh you down. It can be a snare. It can be a temptation. And that's what, what we see happen with Abraham and Lot here. The Bible teaches us that money and possessions are tools we need in life so that we can care for our needs. We cannot be a burden to others. We can bless others and we can advance the work of the kingdom. And it's okay to use money to enjoy life as long as that's not your primary goal and as long as you are making as a goal, caring for your needs and advancing the kingdom, then God will bless you and you can enjoy life. If God's given you much, you gotta be wise, you gotta be prayerful about how you use your money, as Paul says, be on guard against haughtiness, don't put your faith, or your hope or faith in uncertainty of riches. Be rich in good works. Be generous. Be ready to share. And we see that reflected in how Abraham deals with this situation. And we also see the opposite in how Lot deals with this situation. So I think for us, we have to ask the question, are our money, our stuff, is it weighing us down? Do we give too much focus and attention to it? Or are we being diligent to do what God's calling us to do and trusting Him to care for us. Okay, I said more than I should have about point one. Let's get to point two. Point two is when you mess up, you need to get back, get back, get back to where you once belonged, okay? <laughs> Jojo was a man who thought he was a loner. Now, that has nothing to do with this, all right? <laughs> what Abraham did when he found himself in Egypt and he knew he'd messed up was he repented. He went back to the place where he'd been at first. He went back to the altar he'd built. He went back to the land that God had promised him, and he worshiped God. And that's a good pattern. Revelation chapter 2, Jesus is talking to the church at Ephesus, the church that's a great church with one exception. They have lost their first love. And Jesus says to them, he said, what you need to do is remember where you came from, return, repent, and do the works you did at first. When you find yourself outside of God's will, when you find yourself having walked away from God, what you need to do is get back. You go back to where you were, 
to the place, to the, and it may be a geographic place. It may be you get back into church. It may be that you, you get back with the people you needed to be hanging out with. You get back into the word. You get back into the patterns. You turn away. You repent is to turn away from the way you've been walking, turn back to the way you were walking, and you get back with the Lord. Now, you're going to mess up. We are going to mess up. We are people who will find ourselves in a situation where we ignored the Lord, where we weren't thinking about the Lord, we were operating in the flesh, we were doing what we wanted to do. You're, if you haven't been there this week, this past week, you'll probably be there this coming week, okay? It's just a part of living as people who still have a sin nature in us. So when we find ourselves there, what we need to do is remember the promises of God, Turn away, repent, go the other direction, worship God and trust Him. Even if you don't, you, you get back and you go, I'm not feeling it. I go, keep doing it and let the feelings come. Okay? That's enough on that one. Number three, when you're walking with the Lord, peace and harmony should be a priority for you. Or, we could say it this way, if there's disharmony and strife among brothers, somebody's not walking with the Lord. Okay? If you're walking with the Lord, peace and harmony among the brothers is a priority for all who are walking with the Lord. Why? Because it's a priority with the Lord. Abraham, the leader of the clan, the uncle who after his brother had died generously agreed to take care of his nephew Lot, could have responded to this conflict that was going on in a number of other ways. He could have played the patriarch card, right? Nephew, come here. Look, you need to talk to your herdsmen. My sheep go there first. After my sheep are fed, if there's leftovers, your sheep can have them. Well, some of my sheep will die. Tough, okay? We're taking care of my flocks first. Your flocks get second. I'm the patriarch. I'm the boss. He could have played that card. And in fact, in that culture, that was the expectation that that's how you do it. He, he could have said... Um, he could have said to, to Lot, uh, you remember I told you that God promised this land to me? Okay? Um, so God wants my sheep out there grazing, not your sheep. But that's not the card he plays. And, and part of the reason he doesn't play that card is because he's walking with the Lord, he's worshiping the Lord, and he recognizes that there is a higher priority than his stuff getting taken care of. And the higher priority is his relationship with his nephew Lot. You know how big a deal dispute and dissension and disharmony and strife is to God? It's not a small deal to God when his kids aren't getting along. And by the way, parents, it's not a small deal to you when your kids aren't getting along, is it? When your kids are quarreling and they're grumbling and they're griping, you get in, you correct, you get them apart, you say, say you're sorry, you say you're sorry, you, you cure the sibling rivalry because it's a big deal. Why do you do that? First of all, because you want peace in the house. Secondly, you do it because they're going to have to learn how to get along for the rest of their lives. They need to know how to resolve conflict. They know, need to learn how to live at peace with one another. I want you to turn to Galatians, this in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 5. There's a list in Galatians chapter 5 where the Apostle Paul gives us what he calls the deeds of the flesh or the work of the flesh. And when he's talking about the deeds of the flesh, he's saying this is how people who are just doing what feels right to them, they're just responding to their own fleshly impulses, this is how they act, how they live. Verse 19, the deeds of the flesh are evident. Paul says, the works of the flesh are evident. And he starts this list, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, hang on here, look at these, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Okay, look at what's there between sorcery and drunkenness. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissensions, divisions. I mean, if you look at this list, 
You got two or three sins related to sexual behavior, two or three sins related to idolatry, you got some drunkenness, you got a little orgy, and then you got all of this dissension stuff. All of this stuff about people not getting along. This is a big deal. Eight of the, the terms related to the deeds of the flesh are about people who don't get along with one another. Psalm 133 starts by saying how good and how pleasant it is when brothers do what? Dwell together in unity. It's good. It's pleasant. God is pleased. Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 4. What he prays, he says, walk in the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. And he says, he's praying for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace among the brothers. And Jesus, in the last prayer he prays for his disciples before he goes to the cross, at the end of the prayer he prays that they would be one. Father, even as you and I are one. He says, I pray that what the, the kind of intimate fellowship that we have in the, in the Trinity, which has been an unbroken, no-conflict fellowship since before time began, there's never been a time when the Holy Spirit had to say to the Son, look, why don't you take your stuff and go over there? Let's, I just need a time out. It's never happened. And Jesus says, I pray that they would have that kind of relational oneness. This is huge to God. Abraham, who's walking in the Spirit, who is worshiping God, recognizes this. And so he looks at the issue and he goes, I got all this stuff, I got all this money, I'm trying to... It's estimated that at this point, Abraham and his clan, about 500 people. Okay? With a bunch of livestock and tents, and it's a little traveling city. And he's got all of this he's trying to manage... And he goes to Lot and he says, we got a problem. And what's his priority? Let's not quarrel about it. Let's not quarrel. Let's, let's figure out how to do this because we, uh, we need to dwell together in peace. He says, you pick a direction. You go one way, I'll go the other way. Let's just figure out how we can coexist. And by the way, I, I, there's a pragmatic issue that's going on here. One of the reasons it says at this time the Canaanites and the Perizzites were in the land is because... Abraham and Lot needed to remain as allies. The next chapter is about a war that takes place between these, these clans. Abraham says, look, let's not get so sideways that we wind up warring against each other. Let's stay friends. You go your way, I'll go my way. Let's keep the relationship strong. In our membership classes here at Redeemer, which, by the way, we're going to be starting up again in the fall. We'll have another round of membership classes. But one of the things we talk about in one of those classes is how when you're in a community of faith, there needs to be a priority on having a culture of shalom, a culture of peace, a culture of harmony and humility, a culture where we regard one another as more important than ourselves, where we die to self to serve others. That's the pattern that Christ set for us. That's what honors God. That's what Abraham is doing with Lot. He's saying, I will put aside what would, what would benefit me in order to pursue peace. And it's obvious his relationship with Lot is more important than his wealth. Now, there's a lot more I could say about this, but you get the point. I will say this. Kids, young people, listen. God wants you to stop quarreling and fighting, okay? He wants you not to quarrel and fight with your brothers and your sisters. Be like Abraham. Share. Let other people pick first. Be less selfish and be more kind and more generous. And when your heart is right and you're doing that, it pleases God. So get along. All right, that's enough of that. Number four, be careful. Your eyes will play tricks on you. How did Lot decide where he was going to go? Well, the scripture says he looked up, he looked around, and he picked what looked good to him. Last week when we looked at Abraham heading, uh, Abraham heading to Egypt before the famine, I said one of the things that was absent in the story was any sense that Abraham went to the Lord and said, Lord, what's the right thing to do here? Well, you got the same thing that's absent here. We haven't seen that Lot built an altar anywhere. We haven't seen anything about Lot having any kind of spiritual life other than he's just sliding in on Abraham's coattails here. And so when the time comes, Lot does not say, well, what would the Lord have us? Or, or Abraham, uh, consult God and ask him what is the right thing to do. No, there's none of that. He looks up and he goes, you know, desert there 
mountains there. <laughs> There's this valley here that's got the river running through it. Uh, I'll pick the valley, okay? You can have the desert and the mountains. I'll pick the valley. He does what looks right to him, what looks like the best option, what seems right in his own eyes. No divesting himself of any wealth so that he and uh, Abraham could stay together. Ultimately, he could stay with Abraham's God. Just a quick look around and a decision to head in what looked like the best spot to him. And I want you to notice specifically verse 10, something really specific here. It says, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt. Now, why does Moses include that description there? Why does he add that little, this is not just a rhetorical flourish on Moses' part as he's writing this. Moses is giving us insight into what Lot was thinking when he saw that. This was not just a pragmatic choice that Lot was making. This was a spiritual choice that Lot was making. Moses is saying when Lot saw the Jordan River Valley well watered, well irrigated, what he saw in his heart was the Garden of Eden without God. He saw in his heart, I can get to where everything's going to go well for me. He, he saw a, an Eden mirage, a pseudo-Eden that he thought would ultimately make him happy. And, and he said this could... He said, I'm going to pick the land that would be like Eden, or, or at least like Egypt. But one commentator said uh, he, he had left Egypt, but Egypt hadn't left him. He, he was still in his mind dreaming about the benefits that would come from this land. This is, this is what the lust of the eyes leads us to. It leads us to mirages that make us think we're going to find happiness and satisfaction in our circumstances or in our surroundings. Arthur or A. W. Pink says this. He says this was the commencement, outwardly at least, of a decline which ended in the utmost shame. He says eye gate is one of the avenues through which temptations assail the soul. Walking by sight is the cause of most of our failures and our sorrows. Doing what seems right in your own eyes, following your own wisdom, this is the cause of most of your failures and your sorrows. He says, Lot had brought with him out of Egypt something else besides herds and flocks. He had contracted the spirit of Egypt and acquired a taste for its flesh pots. And so when he looks down at the valley, he says, that looks like it could be Egypt. As we'll see when we continue to work our way through Genesis, Lot's move into the Jordan River Valley is the first of several bad moves he makes. Goes into the Jordan River Valley. Then he moves his tents toward Sodom. Then he settles in Sodom. And by the time we meet up with him in chapter 18, he is sitting in the city gates in Sodom. He is one of the respected elders in the wicked city of Sodom. His daughters have married two men of Sodom. He has become fully enmeshed in the life of Sodom. And unless God had come to rescue him, he would have died in Sodom like everybody else. The point is, it was careless, uh, godless lust of the eyes that put him on the path that ultimately led him in the ways of Sodom. Here's what Pink says again. He says, Behold how great a fire a little matter kindles. From lifting up the eyes to beholding the land and seeking pasturage for his flocks to becoming an official in the city of wickedness. See, he just made a little choice. That looks like a good place for me to go. I'll head in that direction. I'll go over there. And I'm sure at the time he thought, I'll be fine. Uh, you know, I've learned a lot. But gradually, there is this downward slide. Uh, if your steps are not ordered by the Lord, every step outside of those ordered by the Lord is a step that puts you on a path that will take you in the wrong direction. Of course, ultimately, the problem wasn't that well, it wasn't Lot's vision. It was Lot's heart. It wasn't his eyes. It was his heart. It's what he wanted. He chose what looked good to him, what pleased him, what he desired, what he thought would bring him money or happiness. His eye was just the gate through which the temptation entered. But we have to be aware. We're the same. We're, we're wired the same way Lot's wired. 
We're all wired for self-fulfillment, for self-advancement. Lot did what's natural, what's normal, what's human. And that's the problem. Abraham did what was supernatural. Abraham had a higher set of priorities than what would please him. At least in this chapter of his life, he was trusting God. The humility, the open-handedness, the desire to live at peace with his nephew, these are all manifestations of the work of the Spirit in Abraham's life. He was walking by faith, not by sight. Look at verse 14. God tells Abraham, look around. Lot looked around, and he saw what looked good to him, and he said, I want that. But here in verse 14, God says to Abraham, you look around now. You lift up your eyes and look around. He says, everything you see, north, south, east, and west, I'm going to give it to you, including the land that Lot just took for himself. I'm going to give it to you. You know, Lot just picked that up. That's going to be yours. That's how we need to learn to walk. We need to seek the Lord, follow the Lord, trust the Lord, put God's plans and purposes and His glory ahead of our own. Lot had a clouded spiritual vision. Abraham had clear eyes and a full heart. Can't lose, right? All right. Don't be passive. Here's number five. Don't be passive about God's promises. Take action. The last five verses of this chapter, this will be quick. God reaffirms and expands the covenant he made with Abraham, but I want you to notice in particular verse 17, he says to Abraham, arise and walk the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. He said, I'm going to give you this land, but he says to Abraham, but you've got a job to do. You've got to get up and walk. Walk around. Possess it. Own it. You need to inhabit it. Go from this place. Don't just sit back and wait for me to fulfill the promises. You've got to be actively involved. God had marching orders for Abraham. Get up and walk through the land. The covenant was a unilateral. It was one-sided. God said, I'm going to give you this blessing. But then he said, you can't earn the blessing, but you have to walk in obedience to, to, uh, to capture it. You have to walk in obedience to experience the blessing. The promises that God has made to Abraham here require action on his part. Same is true with us. The promises God's made to us, the, the promise of our salvation, uh, we, we have to walk in order to, to uh, take hold of those promises. The, the Bible is really clear on that. God has promised, for example, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it, right? But you don't just sit back and say, okay, God, go ahead and complete it. Do that thing. I'll just sit here on the sofa and you do the work. No, you have to walk in the ways of the Lord. You have to follow the direction of the Lord in order for those promises to be actualized, to be realized. God, God tells us to strive, to work out your salvation, to make your body your slave, to grab hold of what He is doing. There's an activeness to the promises of God. And you, you can't be passive about them. Uh, you can't be passive about his promises, about his purposes, or about his plan. In being active, you don't earn his favor or his grace, but you actualize it or you experience it in your life. Here's the last thing I'm going to say this morning before we come to the Lord's table. Abraham's relationship with Lot, I think, is a picture for us of our relationship with the greater son of Abraham, who is Jesus. In Genesis, Lot turns away, leaves his uncle, and heads towards Sodom. Heads in the wrong direction. Gets out from, from being with Abraham. In the same way that the first couple in the garden turned away from God, walked away. In the same way that every one of us, born in sin, has walked away from God. Has said, I'll run my own life, thank you very much. I'll make choices that I think are the right choices to make. And as we'll see in this cha in the, as we go through this story, Abraham's relationship with Lot continues with Abraham pursuing and protecting his wayward nephew. When in the next chapter, when Lot is captured in war, Abraham goes in to rescue him. And when Lot is in Sodom and Gomorrah uh, and judgment is coming, Abraham intercedes for him before God and says, God, will you save the righteous? And God saves the righteous Lot. The same is true with us. The gospel message is this, that we have walked away from God, but God pursues us, that God comes after us, that God draws us back to himself, and that he rescues us. When we gather for communion every week, what we're gathering for is a reminder 
that God's rescue plan for us did not just involve intercession, but it involved sacrifice. God coming to rescue us did not just involve Him coming in to save the day, but it involved Him giving His life through His Son so that we might be rescued. All the things we've talked about this morning, the walking by faith and not by sight, the not being captured by riches, the, the pursuing peace, making it a priority, making relationships a higher thing than money or self, these are not natural tendencies in our hearts, and we know that. And God knows it. And so God has rescued us from those sinful passions and desires by sending His Son to walk with us, His Spirit to indwell us, and to save us, and to transform us, and to make us into a different person. And I think that's the picture that we see of Abraham and Lot's relationship, that there is a, there is a, a, a saving relationship between uncle and nephew. And I think it foreshadows the greater saving relationship that would come in Abraham's greater son, who is Jesus. So as, as you come this morning to receive the elements for communion, you're coming to receive the bread and the cup that signify for you that God's rescue plan of you did require a sacrifice of His Son. And that in order for us to be reunited with and reestablished and, and uh, reconciled to God, we need to receive these elements as a token of what Jesus has already done for us. Uh, as a means of grace in our lives. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, I would encourage you not to come forward for communion. Uh, communion is a family meal for those who are in Christ, and I'd encourage you to stay where you are. If you're here this morning, you're a visitor and you know and love Christ, you're welcome here at the table to receive the bread and the cup because it is a reconfirmation of God's covenant for you, and it's a repledging of your life into His his care. Every time you take the bread and the cup, you're saying, this is where life is found in Christ. So we'd welcome you to come to the table and to make that declaration for your own soul and to make that declaration for all who are here with you this morning. Let's pray, and then the way we do communion, we come down the outer aisle, come up here and receive the cup and the bread, take it back to your seat, and we'll receive those together. Pray with me. Lord, we... Uh, we pause here this morning just to reflect on the fact that uh, the righteousness we see in Abraham is not a righteousness that we see often enough in us. And that the tendencies of Lot's heart are more often the tendencies of our own. Lord, we ask that you would cure us from our sin, that you would continue the transforming work that you've begun. And Lord, we pledge this morning that we will not be passive in that pursuit. We will be active. We will seek you and your kingdom. Now, as we receive the bread and the cup, remind us, Lord, of your love and your sacrifice. Amen. Welcome to come as you're ready.
hold everything together. You hold everything together. He holds everything together. He holds everything together. He Abraham knew what his hope was in, didn't he? He understood where his supply comes from. He understood where his safety comes from, where his security comes from. And that's why he could say, you know, let's make the relationship a priority and let's not, uh, let's not get worried about other things. Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, said to his disciples, this bread is my body which is about to be broken for you, and as often as you receive this, remember me. He was saying, you will find life in me, you will find strength in me, you will find hope in me, and you won't find it anywhere else. And so, Lord, this morning as we receive this bread, we receive it with that acknowledgement that you are the source of life and hope and health and joy. And we receive this because we find all we need in you. We receive it with grateful hearts. Amen. In the same way, after the meal was over, Jesus took the cup. After he had pronounced a blessing on it, he passed it. And he said to his disciples, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, the cup of my blood shed for the remission of your sins. As often as you receive this, remember me. He was saying that our sinful tendencies, our sinful heart, our corrupted nature that leads us away from God, that leads us to follow the impulses of our own flesh, that God forgives what we've done, and that God is transforming who we are. And so this morning, Lord, we receive this cup with grateful hearts, grateful for your forgiveness, and grateful that you are changing us. Make us more into the image of the one we long to be like, our Lord and Master, our older brother, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing that chorus. O Christ, be the center of our lives, and we'll be dismissed with a benediction. O Christ, be the center of Now may the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work you do, his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom all glory 
be forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed.